Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, November Evening at Skidaway Lecture Program. Uh, this will be the last uh, program of the uh, of 2021. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jay Brandis. Dr. Brandis is a marine and freshwater chemist who uses a variety of tools and techniques to study carbon and nutrient cycling, microplastic pollution, and their interactions with light and aquatic life on a wide range of scales. Dr. Brandis received his bachelor's degree from Humboldt State University in California and his master's and doctorate from the University of Washington. He joined uh, Skidaway Institute in 2005. Dr. Brandis, take it away. Thank you, Mike. Um, I appreciate everybody that uh, I can't see on here, but I uh, hope that uh, people have tuned in. I've given this uh, sort of talk on plastic pollution uh, over the years uh, to a variety of different audiences and wanted to go ahead and update folks, not only on what sort of our latest understanding of the problem is, but also um, a little bit of an insight into the type of research that uh, my group is doing here at uh, Skidaway. So, what do I mean by a very 21st century pollutant? As we'll see, plastics have really been a relatively recent um, problem in terms of uh, how much is being produced, where it's being produced, what sorts of things are being produced out there. And uh, it's really only been in this century that scientists have turned their attention to it. And really only in the last 10 years have they turned their attention to a particular type of plastic pollution, which I'm gonna talk about tonight, called microplastics. So uh, let me first just introduce my team. Uh, this is the sort of work that's very labor intensive. So we've had a lot of people working on it over the years. Um, the person in yellow at the top is Dodie Sanders, who is a marine educator at uh, our local uh, Merex group, uh, Marine Education Services of uh, University of Georgia. She just recently retired and I don't know what I'm gonna do without her, but she was essential to getting this uh, project working and working with our volunteers and so on. Um, the woman with uh, the turtle here is Abigail McCormick. She's a graduate student in my lab. And aside, uh, in addition to loving all animals, uh, she has been doing a bang up job looking at microplastics in our local aquarium. She's a person I'm gonna highlight as we go along. Uh, in addition, over the years, we've had a variety of undergraduate interns uh, and they've all been wonderful and they've all contributed little bits and pieces uh, in the times. They're usually here for about two months and then moving on uh, to the rest of their careers. Uh, but they've uh, had wonderful experiences and we've had a great time uh, working with all of them. Uh, and we have a ton of volunteers that have worked with our group over the years. Uh, really uh, fantastic. They've had a lot of uh, great times as well. Um, so let me continue here. And this is a slide, if you've seen some of my previous talks, I was kind of start off with this this idea of how we got into the problem we are in in the first place. And this idea that we live on a limitless planet. Um, we're, our country was founded on the concept of an endless frontier. There's always another place that uh, you can go and uh, you know, set out your own homestead and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and along with this, and it's not just America, but the whole world thought that resources were effectively endless, that you can take endless amounts of oil out of the ground. You can burn endless amounts of fuel. You can uh, you know, chop down all sorts of forests. You can fish the oceans because they're essentially infinite that you know, we could never make a dent in something so large. And as part of this, the oceans and river systems have been seen as an ultimate waste receptacle. And the problem is we're no longer so small. We've increased our population greatly. If you look online right now, our current population estimate is, is in excess of 7.9 billion, uh, rising still fairly rapidly. This figure from a few years ago 
um, had our population reaching 8 billion in 2024, we'll reach it next year. Uh, so we're ahead of schedule on there. And as we've had more and more people uh, on earth, they're using more and more resources. And in addition, we've had a fair amount of, of uh, sort of increasing of living standards, which isn't a bad thing in and of itself. What happens though that it is a problem is if those increases in living standards are associated with an increase in pollution. So the other issue that I don't think gets a very much a, a attention is that we're not evenly distributed across the world. There are nearly 8 billion people. Uh, this is a image of sort of a computer processed image of the uh, nighttime lights of the world, where white are lights coming from our own street lamps and so on, light sources. And you can see them concentrated around different cities around the world. Um, reds are fires that uh, some uh, countries have a lot of in terms of burning uh, to prepare for agriculture. And blues are fishing boats. And you'll see that they're not distributed all over the world evenly. And a majority of the people in this world are actually within about 100 kilometers of the, uh, of the ocean. And in this case, that means proximity to this, what it was thought of as a ultimate dumping site for all of our pollutants. And problem is, of course, with 8 billion people, the frontiers are, are long gone. You can rarely find any place that isn't inhabited or doesn't have some sort of impact uh, from human uh, either passing through or living there. The oceans have reached their limits in many ways. And we see this with increases in harmful algal blooms along the coast with uh, loss of fish species and uh, all sorts of fisheries that used to be at, very active and plentiful, having depleted their fishing stock and uh, not being able to keep uh, things going. The um, resources that we have on Earth, we are discovering are limited. Uh, it should be obvious, but now that we have a much, should have an innate sense of the size of the Earth and what sort of resources are on it. Uh, realize that they're not unlimited and they do have effects if you use these resources up. And pollution effects are not evenly distributed. So you end up with places like this picture from uh, India of just tremendous amounts of plastic pollution uh, along one of the riverbanks. Now, let me go back. Plastic production. This is where we're really getting ourselves into a bind. Um, this is an estimate from this year. And what you can see in blue are the actual measures of plastic production. And you can see that we are increasing our production and that the slope of that line, this sort of thing, it's not a straight line, is it? It's a curved line and it's trending up over time. It's getting steeper over time. Now, what that means is that we're accelerating our production of plastics over time, just like our population is accelerating uh, as well. And with that means that the problems that are caused by this plastic are also accelerating because unfortunately it is getting out into the environment. It is being treated as waste after it's used uh, and it ends up being a real problem. By 2035, it is estimated that the amount of plastic in the oceans will be equal in terms of weight to the amount of fish in the oceans. And by 2050, the production of plastics will equal the basically hydrocarbon carbon usage, the coal usage of coal-fired plants. That doesn't mean that all ends up as CO2, but what it does mean is we're extracting a whole lot of hydrocarbons, which is where most plastics uh, come from, uh, in order to make this particular pollutant. And more and more and more of it is going to end up out in the environment. So one issue that uh, you, know, you can think about is, if you think about over the course of your life, how much our way of life has changed because of plastics, 
when I was growing up as a kid back in the 1970s, we didn't really use plastic bottles very often. We had some for sodas, uh, but you know, in terms of water uh, or you know, a lot of things, we'd either have thermoses or we would uh, get water from drinking fountains or containers. When I first started going to scientific meetings, people would put out uh, you know, paper cups with a uh, container of, of ice water, and that's how you fill it up. Now, when you go to a meeting, uh, there's a whole tr table full of plastic bottles. And there's a plastic bottle for every single person. And you can see that in that graph off to your right, where you end up with more and more plastic uh, production every single year. So, okay, we're making more plastics. Well, what happens to them? This is an estimate from 2015. And in this estimate, the yellow box represents the total amount of plastics that end up in as trash. Now, some plastic we have as plastic in certain usages that lasts a very long time and doesn't end up as trash. You can think about something like a, the receptacle on your wall outlets. That's going to stay there until, you know, whenever uh, that receptacle is updated, the house is redone, the house is torn down. Uh, it's gonna stay there for years, decades, and so on. Um, but a lot of the stuff that we use, like those plastic bottles, ends up in the trash. Now, most of it is thought to actually end up in landfills, in some sort of controlled environment where it doesn't go any further. This isn't an ideal solution, but it's not you know, terrible, especially for the oceans. However, something like 10% or so is uh, not properly disposed of. And you see this along the sides of roads, you see it in rivers, you see it in lakes, you see it along the, the coastline. Um, and a smaller portion of this, about 10% or so, um, or sorry, about uh, three or 4%, ends up as trash in the oceans. It makes it all the way out there. That doesn't seem like much, but 8.75 million metric tons is far more plastics than were produced when I was a, a, you know, a young kid. So when I was four or five. And the problem is each of these things scales. So as we produce more plastics, as that curve goes up, each of these boxes gets bigger. The production of plastics and trash and landfill spaces and what escapes out and gets into the environment scales up with the amount of plastics that we're producing. And this has led to a problem that we've only come to appreciate in the last 10 or so years. And that is that plastic pollution is everywhere. You find plastic in the ocean every place you look. You find nets, pieces of containers, trash, floats, clothing, docks, whatever, all over the place, out hundreds or even thousands of miles from the nearest piece of land. Again, 8 million tons of plastic entering into the oceans. And they end up in these areas that we call the great uh, gyres or the great garbage patches now, uh, where ocean currents will concentrate them, will sweep them out of the rest of the ocean and concentrate them in these areas. And these areas are these gyres, these garbage patches. One thing I'd like to impress upon you is the scale of this, these things. This one in the Pacific is twice the size of the state of Texas. And if you've ever driven through the state of Texas, you know that's one big state. And it is a problem of scale and magnitude that I, it's hard to wrap our heads around, but it's also something that we have to realize that the scale of these things is such that we can't just simply go out there and sweep this up. Uh, there are very well-meaning people that have had expeditions to go out there and they'll tow some device behind them. And the biggest ones might be the size of a parking lot you can't clean something that's the size of Texas with something that's the size of a normal parking lot. Uh, and part of the problem is that 
these areas are constantly being fed by more and more plastic coming from our shores, coming from all that stuff that's being produced. So the solution to this is going to have to rely upon taking that curve, that increasing amount of plastic that, and turning it around and making it go down and getting ourselves into a world where we are much more efficient at the use of the plastics that we do have. Again, all the oceans have plastics on them. This is something that, again, you should I'm try to impress upon folks. Every beach that scientists have studied has plastics. The Arctic Ocean is full of plastics. The Antarctic has plastics around it. There are plastics in the mid depths of the ocean because not all plastics are light and float on the surface. Um, there are even plastics in the deepest part of the ocean. This is a picture uh, taken by one of the robotic subs uh, that Japan has. And it looks at a place called the Marianas Trench, the deepest part of the ocean in the Pacific. It is so deep that you could put the Mount, Mount Everest in the Marianas Trench and you would end up with it still being underwater. It's deeper than Everest is high. And yet at this depth, when they sent a submarine down there, they found pieces of plastic and pieces of trash and other pollutants down there. So it's everywhere. It's contaminated places that we never thought we would see these types of contaminants. And, you know, people have started to pay attention to this. They've started to notice it and want to do something. And wanting to do something needs to be done in a way where you think about what you're doing and also not to just sort of get complacent and say, okay, I did one thing, that's all I need to do. There are a variety of efforts underway. There's lots of different uh, groups that uh, claim that they're making a dent in the problem. Um, they aren't, but uh, they are certainly uh, making some efforts. And of course, there's always marketing. You know that companies are gonna notice this sort of interest. Uh, this is a bottle of Windex. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I found that the, the label on there was uh, somewhat ironic. It says 100% ocean bound plastic. Well, does that mean that when I'm done with this bottle of Windex, I should go to Tybee Island and chuck it into the ocean to make sure that this is a, a promise or, what and and you know the thing is that it really isn't going to be ocean bound if i take the effort to either reuse it or make sure it's either recycled or make sure it goes into the proper landfill uh, but again it's a confusing level of marketing that doesn't necessarily solve any problem so what happens to plastics in the environment they start off mostly as big things like that bottle of Windex, like a bottle of drinking water, like a foam container or a plastic bag or other types of bottles, like a shirt made out of polyethylene or polypropylene or nylon or whatever. Um, they start off as these bigger things and they break into smaller pieces. If any of you have done any kind of cleanup efforts along the side of the road, or out at the beach or at the marsh, you'll be familiar with finding things like plastic bags or bottles that have gotten brittle, that have started to break into shreds and pieces and they become really hard to pick up. Um, so there's this process as they spend time in the environment where they start to break down. Some of that is helped by light or by bacterial activity and that is very dependent upon the type of plastic it is. Um, some end up in the surface ocean. They get swept out through rivers, as we've already seen. Uh, we think about plastics mostly floating. Well, those end up in those great gyres. Some get buried in sediments because, again, some plastics are heavier. And some plastics, as they float along the surface, organisms will grow on their surfaces and make them heavier, and eventually they sink. Uh, so there is a constant rain of plastics on the surface down into the deep ocean. The thing is, as this process is taking place, they're also breaking into smaller and smaller pieces. Now, in some cases, they're already small 
your shirt with fibers in it or your sheets with microfibers in it that's made out of plastic, well, those fibers break off and end up either in your washing machine or your dryer or in the air around you. And as we'll see in a little bit, those fibers form a major uh, proportion of the micro or the plastics that we find in the environment. Uh, and some are made small, micro beads, which used to be a real issue with cosmetics and now uh, have been banned in a lot of places. Uh, something called nurdles, you'll hear about that. There was a huge uh, problem with a ship going down, I think it was off of Sri Lanka, that was full of nurdles. And what nurdles are, are these small little pellets of pure plastic that get shipped from a plastic production facility to a manufacturing joint where they can be turned into bottles or into plastic bags or into containers. They're the raw material. And those generally are made elsewhere and then shipped to where they are needed for manufacturing. In any case, the really small stuff becomes really hard to deal with. So we're talking about something that we call microplastics. So what are microplastics? You hear about this, you see reports and studies and things like that. And what we mean by this, scientists have to sort of agree upon um, you know, what we're talking about. And in this case, we're talking about things that are smaller than five millimeters or a quarter of an inch long. Uh, so the biggest ones you can still see with your eye, but the smallest ones get a lot smaller than that. So here is a, basically what we call a histogram. Each one of these bars represents an abundance of plastics found along a large collection group. And these blue bars here uh, represent their their amount of these particles that were found in the ocean. That red line represents our artificial delineation between regular plastic debris and what we call microplastics. So everything over here is what we would call a microplastic. And you see the majority of what they found were what we would call microplastics. Most of them are sort of in this, so you know, two millimeter range, one millimeter range, but you see they get down smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and they never quite go away. And as scientists, what we have to do is look at a size range. The smaller you look at things, the, the, when you try to look at really tiny things, it becomes extremely difficult, and the instrumentation needed to do that type of analysis becomes harder and more expensive, harder to get time on, uh, more time consuming and so on. So most studies that are out there will set a lower range and try to figure out, uh, you know, everything that's above that. We'll do the same as I talk about this a little later. Um, anyway, a variety of sources from these things. Why am I interested in this? Well, these are the things that interact with people. These are the things that interact with organisms. Most of the life in the ocean is tiny. It's small sizes. The plants are very small, usually single-celled organisms. The animals that eat them are small. They're usually smaller than a millimeter in size. And this microplastic range ends up being of a size that intimately interacts with them. They either eat it, they breathe it in, uh, and so on. And we know this because people have started to look at this problem. Why do we care? Well, if I can't do anything else, I can say that each and every one of you listening has ingested microplastics, has breathed in microplastics. This was a study that was done a couple of years ago, and it found that you can go across the list here. Uh, people have consumed or inhaled roughly uh, a total of 93,000 particles made out of plastic. And you don't see these things in the air. Uh, if you're lucky, if you're looking, you might see kind of dust in the air, but a lot of that dust is plastic. Uh, when we take our samples, we have to make very careful uh, preparations in order to avoid having uh, our samples contaminated by the plastics in clothing or carried along in the air or whatnot. Even in my laboratory, um, we find plastic contamination unless we take very special precautions. So this adds up. 
over time, they've estimated that something like 40 pounds of plastic is ingested, just this one column here, um, in the form of microplastics. And everyone's doing it. And we don't know where, what we're eating. We don't even know its composition. Because again, it's hard to measure this stuff. You can't just look at it and go, oh, there's a piece of polypropylene or whatever. And um, when we did a study a few years back, we found that 20% of the fish that we had sampled, fish and shrimp, had 20, had microplastics, and these were small organisms, uh, in their guts. Um, so the contamination is out there. The contamination is around us. It is in you. These are what these sorts of things look like. These are samples from different places along uh, Florida's estuary. And you can see, you know, thin little pieces of plastic here, chunks of fiber here. There's some more fibers that are harder to see uh, in here. Here's a more clearly defined one in here. Um, and we find these things all up and down the coast. So this is from um, a study that we did a few years ago. And just looking at contamination levels along the Georgia coast, you can see that the reds and oranges, which represent the highest levels of contamination are focused right around Savannah, the city of Savannah and, and suburbs around here, or Richmond Hill, and also around Brunswick. So the two major cities along the Georgia coast. And the lowest levels are found in these areas in between um, not always, because it tend to be fairly variable. But if you take the lowest levels and you scale this up to this whole area along Georgia, all of these intercoastal waterway systems, and we just take a very conservative estimate, we end up with something like a trillion microplastic particles or fibers altogether in Georgia's intercoastal waterway, a trillion. World estimates of microplastics and larger are something on the order of 51 trillion. Well, I think if we've got a trillion in our waters, we're probably a much higher number when you talk about the vast area of the oceans and all the different uh, coastal environments out there because our coastline isn't nearly as developed as a lot of other coastlines around the world. Okay, well, I'd like to try to give you a little sense for why don't we have better ideas for the numbers of these things? Why don't we have more data in terms of their concentrations in different places? And microplastics are a really hard thing to analyze. It's not like, you know, you pick up a microplastic under a microscope and you see that there's a little triangle symbol with a number on it. You can tell exactly what plastic it is. Um, they don't come with identification. A lot of times they look like other types of material that are out there. They're easily contaminated, as I said. You have to spend a lot of time figuring out how to sample, collect samples, store samples, process samples, all that sort of stuff without getting more plastics in them. Um, you need to separate them from their environment. There's always other things. There could be beach sand in the sample. There could be other like organisms. So as I said, a lot of organisms in the oceans are very small. You need to separate them from the environment and then you need to concentrate them down so that you can look at them under a microscope. They can look for these really small plastic pieces. And finally, the only way to really identify whether something is a microplastic or whether it's something else is that you need some sort of complex, expensive instrumentation that can establish it, some sort of method of measuring its chemical composition. And one of the sort of real steps forward that's happened here at Skidaway is in the last year and a half, we've gotten ourselves a expensive piece of complex instrumentation called a confocal Raman microscope. And the technique here is spectrum microscopy. Now, bear with me, even if you're, you know, have no science background, I'll try to make this simple. Um, this is the instrument down here, and it basically is a microscope with a laser attached to it and then a lot of fancy optics. And the way this works is we have a laser, we actually have a couple different types, and it 
you look through the microscope, you target a spot where your sample is, where you want to figure out what it is. You beam that laser down onto that sample. Now, what happens is the light hits that sample. Most of it just gets reflected back. Just like when you're looking at your wall, the light's being reflected back at you. And that's what you're seeing. And, but a small part, and it's a tiny bit of that light interacts with the molecules, with the very substance of that sample. And it's altered by that substance. It changes its wavelength. It changes its color ever so slightly. And the rest of this machine is basically designed to get rid of all that reflected laser light, just take it out of there and only look at these things here, which are these light that comes from it that was altered. And so you end up with a series of peaks that, uh, peaks of light that have different wavelengths or different frequencies, different colors. And you can use those like a fingerprint to tell what it is you're looking at. So you can use those to fingerprint your sample and tell what type of plastic it is, or if it's not a plastic. Um, a lot of times you can tell things like, you know, some things about minerals and other compositions. Um, this is just another shot with the laser on. So what do I mean by this? Well, I got samples from uh, a lab up in Charleston and uh, basically they were looking at microplastics and fish. And they sent me something like 250 samples. They're all white fibers. Every one of them looked under the microscope like a white fiber. You wouldn't know what it was if you just looked at it. When you use the Raman, some of the white fibers, and here's a picture of one of them up here, have a particular fingerprint. And the machine has a library of these fingerprints. It's kind of like forensics um, that can tell me that that's a polyester fiber. On the other hand, here's another white fiber on here, and it doesn't really look that much different. It's the same color and about the same size and so on, but it has a different fingerprint and it, is identified by the machine as cotton. And we use standard you know, materials like a real piece of cotton and real pieces of polyester to make up those fingerprint libraries. It isn't perfect. Sometimes you have a sample that you can't get an identifiable spectrum on. Sometimes you get the spectrum of the dye that dyes it. This is a real problem when we talk about things like denim and blue colored things seem to give the machine fits. But through a lot of it, we can sort of work through this, especially with more uh, you know, experience and time, understanding uh, what we're seeing. The other intrinsic issue with microplastics is that they vary a lot in space and time. So you saw along the coastline that they varied in space. This was a study done by one of my interns and uh, they basically just went out to the dock here at Skidaway and sampled the intercoastal waterway. Um, and they sampled it at low tide and high tide on the same days. The blue line is low tide samples. And you can see they're relatively constant, but they did vary by an order by basically three times. So here's four and here's 12 on two different days. And if you looked at high tide, they varied even more went from two to 32, so 16 times variability. Um, actually, the lowest one was, was on that following Monday, so 32 times variability. So the highest one is 32 times as large as the lowest one. And if you're a biologist or you're trying to understand, okay, what kind of contamination is out there, it might make a big difference if you have an animal living in this type of water with 32 particles per four liters versus a part of sample, uh, animal that's basically living in almost microplastic free water. Um, and trying to establish this takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Oops, I am, there we go. Um, let me go back, I skipped some. So yeah, okay, sorry. <clears throat> so this brings me to Abby's project. And Abby came here wanting to study microplastics, but also 
really loving aquarium science and aquarium research and being really interested in interacting with animals and trying to sort of make a uh, make some progress on on studying what's going on in these systems and we fortunately have a small aquarium on campus. This is a picture of the aquarium space itself. Um, she started here back in August, 2020. Everything is closed down at that point. Aquariums closed down. The only people that were allowed in there at the time were employees of the aquarium. Uh, she got permission to go in as well to take samples every two weeks from these four places. There's a couple tanks here. There's the source water we call the reservoir. And then there's a public aquarium space here. And so we have different environments. Some of them are more exposed to people. Some of them are less exposed to people. This is only exposed out here in this area where only the uh, people that work at the aquarium are allowed to go. Um, so we have a range of these things. And the idea was, and is, that she would sample this during the time that the aquarium was closed and then continue to sample when the aquarium was open to get a sense for how much was activity for people's activity affecting the microplastic levels. Because we think, and, and other studies have shown that people can carry plastics with them. And she did this with sampling every two weeks uh, over this, this time, and then analyzing them on that special microscope uh, in a very time consuming manner. But she's gotten some really interesting data. So, I'm just going to talk about the stuff from the aquarium when it was ostensibly closed. It wasn't free of activity, but it was free of visitors. And what we see um, are a couple of things. One thing that Abby did was just look at the shapes of things and divided everything up into what we call fibers. So that's anything that looks thread-like and masses, which is anything that looks chunk-like. Uh, you know, that isn't fiber shaped. And again, like I was talking about before, most of what we see here and most of what other studies have shown is that um, it, they're fibers and not chunks. So we're looking at things that are initially coming from textiles or some other type of material that's woven. Um, this is something that the whole field has noticed around the world in different locations. When we look at the composition, this is where we can make a big difference because now a lot of the fibers were white or clear. Again, not easy to tell what the heck they're made out of. Um, she found that a lot of the fibers, and this was surprising but is also being seen, are made out of cellulose. And what do you mean by cellulose? Well, cellulose is a biopolymer. It's produced by plants and it can be as simple as something like cotton or linen, but it can also be modified chemically and you'll end up with something like rayon. Uh, bamboo is also known as tensile. Um, there are a variety of different modified celluloses out there. The important point is that these are fibers that we're not finding them from plants, we're finding them through textiles. And once again, we don't really know what their effect is on organisms either. But a large portion of the, uh, of the uh, fibers were cellulose. But we also saw yellow, which is polypropylene, uh, polyester, uh, a category what we call unknown, which is, again, the machine is not capable of telling us exactly what's there. Um, we saw, saw a bit of nylon and uh, basically a few categories of some other things like uh, Teflon, for example. The masses, again, these are all in the same tank, but they're much more heavily plastic. So plastic here, uh, plastic, 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 and different kinds of plastics, like PVC, which is the stuff that like pipes are made out of in your plumbing. This is a time series pattern. And um, basically when you look at this, the idea is she started off trying to understand what the basic levels were of microplastic uh, concentrations in the whole system. Um, and 
in this case, what she saw was an initial level. It's fairly flat. And, you know, there's variability like we talked about, but fairly flat. And all the tanks were about the same in that uh, process here. What you saw as she was working was that they decided to do some uh, renovations. So there was removal of carpet and replacement of carpet. So people had to come in. And there was an initial one here at about 80 days. Um, now this is in an auditorium area that's in another part of the building, doesn't have uh, you know, a strong connection to the aquarium. And that didn't seem to do too much, but around 110, 120 days, uh, they did basically replace the carpet around tanks A and 11, this lower area and the reservoir. And what we saw or what she sees is an increase in the amount of stuff that was uh, you know, collected during those times, an increase in these microplastics after this disturbance event. And then they did a second renovation where they replaced the carpet only on the higher level near the touch tank, but still that's in the aquarium part. And we see also a spike, but after a short period of time, uh, again, both in the reservoir and in the touch tank, we see it most, uh, most clearly. Now, the touch tank being the most exposed, we expected to see this sort of thing. The reservoir is a bit of a surprise because it's kind of in the back. It's not, uh, you know, as exposed, especially to the public areas as these other tanks. And it's interesting that it, you know, also showed this uh, increase and it showed these sorts of disturbances. What we were really surprised about is that, you know, you would think, oh, this must be pieces of, of, of carpet. Well, carpets are made of nylon. We did not see an increase in nylon along this time period. We did not see increases in nylon here or here. We saw increases in polyethylene and polypropylene, which are more like the sorts of stuff that your clothing is made out of. So maybe that's coming from the workers, but it was very surprising. We were really expecting to see something from the carpet itself. And, come on. Let me make sure I'm in the right place. Yes, yeah, sorry about the back and forth here. The other thing that she can do with the microscope, and this is really tedious and time consuming, is to measure the sizes of these things. So sizes of fibers, sizes of the masses. And the only real information I wanna tell you is, you see this again, this kind of hump, and it's cut off at the place where we cut off sampling. So anything smaller than 50 microns in size down here, we don't collect. It goes through our filters. It just does not collect it because again, it's very hard to separate um, microfibers from all the other stuff that's at that size range. So we're pretty sure that this is just an artifact of that. And then that there are smaller microplastics in the system. We're starting to look you know, in detail at that particular question. And this is important because really small microplastics, stuff that's down there, I think I mentioned these are ones that cause a lot of problems. These have been shown by scientific studies that they can cross your gut wall and go into cells, go into bloodstreams. They've been found in human placenta, pregnant, uh, you know, recently pregnant women. Uh, they have been found uh, in all sorts of uh, organisms. They were, there was a study that found that they went from mosquito larva into the metamorphosed adult because they were in their cells and they got carried with the, with the mosquitoes. Uh, they've also been found to have the strongest um, uh, bad effects upon the health of organisms when they've gone through and tested uh, the effect on them. So the fact that we have this distribution and it is, you know, it's skewed here towards say two, 300 microns, but it probably has stuff a lot smaller means that this is the sort of stuff that we might want to really look at removing from the aquarium. So some take home points. Um, the only tank that we really found that differed significantly on average was the touch tank uh, in terms of like, if you took the whole average of all that sort of 
uh, data set that she had or she has, but she had higher levels. And we expect that. And that kind of verifies our hypothesis that this open area with a lot of open you know, surface can collect plastics in it and get more contaminated. We expect that this touch tank is going to increase its contamination level once you get kids in. And we basically started that experiment this summer when the aquarium reopened. Um, but we'll see. That's just a hypothesis. In science, you have to test these things. And sometimes you're really surprised, just like we did not see increases in carpet-based plastics, but we did see, um, again, I didn't write this correct, renovations did increase levels of plastics. It shouldn't say carpet-based, uh, but it didn't uh, increase the level of plastics. It didn't increase carpet-based plastics, it increased other types of plastics. And that's surprising because we would have expected you're cutting up pieces of plastic and moving them around and stuff. You would expect that that would have produced microplastics and threads and stuff like that. But we didn't see really any appreciable increase in that. And finally, because all the aquarium tanks always seem to come down to about the same level, we think that there's a certain amount of contamination that's just coming in um, with the water from outside. And as I showed you before, there are microplastics in the water in the, um, in, in uh, you know, the, the Skidaway River outside the aquarium, which is where we get the water for that reservoir. So we're not sure at this point, but our hypothesis is that that reservoir uh, is not being very effective at filtering out microplastics. And that's getting passed on to other tanks. Now, that's a hypothesis that we can test. So we have some suggestions. Um, one is to put in better filters between the reservoir and each tank. Basically, really filter out the microplastics as best as you can in between each tank as the water flows from the reservoir into another tank. Filter it to try to remove as many microplastics as possible. Now, if it turns out that we still see a bunch of microplastics in the water, then it's coming from some other source. So you can try testing that by putting lids on the tank. Put on, just like you have an aquarium at home, except that in this case, these aquariums do not have lids. This is part of the space uh, behind the scenes. And these are tanks. This is the reservoir tank, the one in gray. The one in blue is tank A11. And you can see that they have open tops to them. That's a place where you can get lots of microplastics uh, coming in. And then finally, try and reduce the use of plastics and filtration wherever possible. So we can get rid of some of that PVC and other things. These are all made of PVC here. Um, and we can try to reduce the use of plastics and filtration wherever possible. So I'm gonna close off here uh, with just a few pieces of advice. and. It's a huge problem. You know, if you think about it, we're all bathed in this stuff. We're bathed in our own trash, essentially, at this point. Um, we still don't understand the long-term health effects of being bathed in this trash. Uh, we do know that they have health effects on certain organisms, things like bivalves, uh, things like shrimp and so on. They have shown that there are uh, bad effects if you get up to certain levels of microplastics in their diet. But what we've got to do is take that curve that, we sh that I showed you before, that exponentially increasing production curve and bend it back, bend it down. And there are ways to do this, but they take a change in sort of philosophy. Instead of thinking of plastics as just these harmful things that we can just toss in the trash can, and you know, move on. No, we have to think about better ways of using plastics and reducing the total amount of plastic that we produce. So there are these you know, sort of keys. You reduce the total amount of plastic production. How do you do that? Well, you reuse plastics. So for example, I mean, one of the more powerful things you can do out there is instead of getting you know, a dozen plastic, plastic bags from Kroger every time you go there, 
get a reusable bag, use it. You will be amazed at how much less plastic you end up dumping into your trash cans. You can repair certain types of plastics or they can be sent back. Uh, this would be more high value sorts of things uh, like car parts and so on. And you can recycle them and we are getting better at this, but there's very little economic incentive. So most of the plastics that are recycled aren't really recycled, they're put in landfills and that's got to change. And then we have to eventually you know, work on things like removing plastics from the environment. And this means things like beach cleanup efforts that we're already doing. But if we reduce and reuse, this becomes easier and easier. Nature does have a great capacity for fixing the kind of damage that humans create, but it's gone well past that capacity uh, in this century. And that's what needs to change. We get to the point where we have reduced and we are getting stuff out into the system. We're not taking oil and converting it into more and more plastics. Then the environment with our help will clear up a lot of this. We won't be breathing in tons and tons of plastics as we go along. So it isn't an easy solution. It isn't something that any one person can do. It isn't anything that any one nation can do. It's kind of like the problems with uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. We have to work together and we have to not live worse lives. We have to live smarter lives. They can be just as good or even better, but we have to actually pay attention to what we're doing and not just keep fouling our nest with this stuff. And that's, that's my take home message anyway. Um, and with that, I think we'll uh, close and uh, just I'll answer questions if there's any. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, uh, I'll, uh, I mentioned in the chat on YouTube, if uh, folks want to type questions into the chat window there, um, they're welcome to do so. We'll ask them the speaker. We have a couple questions already lined up to ask. Um, so we had a question um, asking, uh, some municipalities have elected to ban the use of like things like single pl use plastics, plastic straws and bags and stuff. Um, do you think efforts like that are um, good at helping reduce the production in the long run or is it too early to tell? Um, yeah, I think every little bit helps. I know that with plastic bag bans that that has really helped. Uh, it's seen reductions of 90, 95% just by simply putting, let's say, a 10 cent cost on plastic bags. Um, if, if you go to certain countries like countries in Europe or even certain states, if you go in the grocery store, you won't get plastic bags. Uh, you have to either pay for them or in a lot of places, you have to pay for something you can reuse like this. When I went to Finland, that was all they had were these, uh, you know, fancier bags. And I've used those ever since. Uh, coming back here, I get a lot of compliments on them. So it can help. It will not cure the biggest problem that we have, which is this vast amount that's going up. But every bit can help. And it's a relatively easy thing to do. Hmm. Oh, that's really interesting to hear. Um, what do you think about this sort of global plastic outlook in general? Do you think that um, the trend is, is downwards? I mean, you showed the data that it's actually, it's not, the rate is increasing over time. Um, yeah. So do, do you know if this has been like the topic at things like the COP26 conference that's going on? Uh, are plastics sort of on the same stage as uh, uh, global climate change and global warming and ocean acidification? Uh, they're not, they're not there yet. I mean, I, certainly they're talked about. But uh, in terms of climate change, they're not something that, uh, you know, rises up to the importance of CO2. And I wouldn't expect it to be. I mean, CO2 is a major driver of climate change. Um, these are having, a, a, I guess, a more subtle effect and effect that we don't know very well. We still don't have a lot of information on this. And quite frankly, there's not much um, there are not many resources out there. Governments don't provide nearly the amount of resources to study plastic pollution as they do to, say, study um, acidification, for example. Um, and, you know, that, that's just the nature of it right now. So it's not, not there yet. Uh, part of it just 
requires more education and it part of it because because uh, people need to understand that you know it's affecting them directly just like a hurricane affects them directly just more subtly i guess is the important point it's it's a personal thing hmm. yeah that's an interesting point right because the um I, I would say and you probably found this true i mean you study plastics directly but as oceanographers i get i get asked about plastics in the gyre all the time it's probably the, one of the top questions folks ask they usually ask about it now nowadays before climate change and and telling folks that it's not just in the ocean but it's in their bodies and in their food and everything else is it's a really powerful message right yeah and um you know it's it's uh <sighs> I think when, when people see this and see the data and see these studies, they do get appalled. I have a, na- a neighbor of mine across the street. He's a retired gentleman. And, uh, and he, uh, you know, stopped me in the street and said, hey, did you see that study in the, in the New York Times that came out? And it was a study about microplastics and baby poop. And that resonated with him. It was like, oh, my gosh, even babies are getting this type of pollution in them, at, you know, at that age. Uh, and, you know, I've never done any work scientifically that gets this level of public interest. Um, but I've also, it's, it's been really hard to try to convince government uh, agencies and funding agencies to actually fund more research in this. A lot of this has been done sort of um, what we call piggybacking off of other studies. So other things that keep my lab going. And then we try to, you know, do this on the side. That's a, that's a little disturbing to hear. <laughs> right. It's hard to study something that's there, hard to there's study. No, <laughs> there's something that you would understand. There's no geotraces for plastics. You know, there's no big national program to understand plastics mm, for plastic mm. pollution. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, let's see. Um, we have a question in the chat asking, um, uh, it says, I'm trying to wear 100% cotton to avoid stretchy clothes and things that uh, might have nylon in them. Uh, what other types of things can we do? Um, are we close to finding about, uh, is there active research like looking into the health risks and things like that or things consumers can do? Um, well, they're definitely you know, doing the right thing there as much as possible. Try to stick with, uh, you know, non, non-plastic, non-human derived, uh, you know, fabrics. And this includes things like blankets and pillowcases and sheets and, and so on. Uh, because a lot of those end up being, you know, like if you go to Target, you'll see that, uh, you know, the cheapest sheets are microfiber. And if you look at that, they're actually polypropylene. So uh, it's, you know, it's basically making choices like that. There hmm. is some research on how these are affecting health. I know because I've talked to uh, EPA scientists and uh, Uh, people that have had connections with the CDC, for example. Um, Again, it's small and we're working up to it. And a lot of times it's really hard because again, it's a huge amount of work to get a small amount of data. Um, Hmm. You know, it's, it's just, there's no automated method out there like there is for, let's say mercury contamination. Well, there are machines that can give you the contamination levels of mercury relatively easily especially once they're set up they can run thousands of samples you know in a semi-automated fashion we have nothing like that for microplastics yeah it's crazy right we've been um, using these things for decades and actually making measurements of them is so challenging something we're only doing for (laughs) a couple of years (laughs) yeah yeah and hopefully that will change now that there's more interest in this i know some of the uh, instrument manufacturers have been putting an effort into uh, trying to come up with better methods, but intrinsically you're looking at very tiny things and trying to figure out what they're made out of. And that's, Hmm. as you know, Dan, not an easy thing. Right. And everything that you're wearing and everything you're putting it on, the instrument itself is made of plastic, right? True. It's it's the modern equivalent of trying to measure trace metals on a metal ship. (laughs) Yep, exactly. Other um, sort of related question, um, are there like certain journals or sources that folks can, can look at that um, tend to publish research on these that um, members of the public might find interesting? Uh, that's a good question. I can't point to any one because they're all scattered. Um, mm. National Geographic has done some really nice sort of synopses on the plastic pollution problem. Um, so you'll see that and you'll see, 
um, in, you know, in like the major newspapers every so often they'll, they'll discuss the, uh, you know, some study that comes out, which they think is important to the public. Uh, you know, there, there are, you know, really so, sort of specialty journals like environmental toxicology and marine uh, pollution journals and things like that, uh, that have these, but I'd have to think about it for a while to try to think of like a, there, you know, again, there's no like, I guess, journal that I can point to that kind of right, no single journal, yeah, line between public and private. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, a lot of folks, a lot of folks are interested in this. Use sort of use Google Scholar or just Google it, and over time, yeah. your news feed will start showing you articles, right? Yeah, oh yeah, and uh, you know, the the fact is that uh, you know most of the publications that have come out have come out in the last five years. Uh, hmm. It's just been an explosion of of literature in this right, particular right. field. Yeah, great. Uh, I think we have time for one one last question, just past eight o'clock. So, um, uh, have there been studies of microplastics in bottled water? Um, the the oh, yeah. uh, user writes uh, that there's been like they used to buy store bought like gallon jugs of distilled water, and they heard that those were the worst culprits. Uh, I don't know if worse is the right question or right way to describe it, but there was mm -hmm. a pretty famous study a few years back where they looked at microplastics in plastic bottled water and found a ton of them in there. So, you know, again, you're, you're taking a plastic bottle, you'd expect there to be some, but during the manufacturing process, you still end up with even more in these and they're not filtered to get rid of the microplastics in there. So, Every time you open up a bottle of water and drink it, you're getting a dose of microplastics. Hmm. Uh, interesting. Yeah, things to things to worry about as everyone goes to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, and the thing is, I don't want to come across as like a complete doom and gloomer because if microplastics were really uh, poisonous, like asbestos, for example, then we'd have really huge health issues going on. Everybody would be sick from this stuff. I think it's more subtle than that. And it's gonna depend upon a person's physiology and their exposure level and what they're exposed to and what those plastics carry on them because plastics are really good at carrying other organic molecules, things like plasticizers. And those make plastics um, you know, flexible and have been shown to have all sorts of endocrine disrupting uh, things. We've seen that in the environment quite a bit. So we're putting these things into our body that can disrupt our endocrine system. Uh, again, we don't know to how much and what sort of chronic exposure, which is what we're talking about here, might do to us. But it's not something that is going to cause us all to drop dead tomorrow or next week or next month. But it might change our health in 10 years. It might be that sort of system. We just don't yeah, know. Yeah, especially in light of the, the growing production, right? So yeah, it's one thing yeah. if, if numbers are going down, but numbers per person are going up. Yeah, it's not like we're getting rid of it like we did with asbestos in the environment or in our you know houses and stuff, although not necessarily in this lab. But uh, anyway. That's great. Yeah, thanks. And um uh, I think there's one final slide here showing the upcoming talks or actually, no, probably not. No, 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 we the have last no talk of the calendar year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah so I'll look to the usual sources to see um, an updated schedule for 2022 once uh, we all sign up for it. And um, if you're not on the list server, um, email our um, public outreach person, Mike Sullivan, if you'd like to be added to our list and uh, hear about the 2022 schedule when it gets announced. Uh, but otherwise, thanks for joining us. And thanks, Jay, for uh, giving us a great talk. Thank you, Dan. And uh, thanks everybody that uh, was listening in. Hopefully we'll go back to uh, in-person talks uh, in the near future. Great.